Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We are getting ready to have an old-fashioned Bible study. We invite you to get your Bible and join us. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 27 here in a moment. In our last lecture, we saw David making yet another bad decision. Uh, he wanted to know how many soldiers he had under him in the armies of Israel. Back when he was going up against Saul, he had that ragtag army of two to four hundred men, and they were getting the better of Saul's thousands. Why? Because David was trusting God. Now, rather than trusting God, David is going to put his trust in how many soldiers he has reporting under him. So. Uh, it, Joab wasn't pleased, uh, the commander-in-chief, he said, why do you want to bring this sin, this transgression on Israel? And David prevailed, he went ahead, Joab started numbering, he wasn't in any hurry, and he completely left out uh, the tribes of uh, Levi and Benjamin. Uh, not only was Joab not happy with David, God was not happy with David. And the Lord sent his prophet Gad to David and gave David three choices. You can have famine in the land for three years. That wouldn't be good for the sheep, the people of Israel. Uh, your enemies pursuing you right at your heels for three months. That would not be David's uh, cup of tea. Or uh, the, the pestilence, a plague of the Lord for three days. Uh, David couldn't make up his mind. He kind of left it in God's hand. He said, I trust the Lord to, to be merciful to us. And anyway, the Lord chose the pestilence, the plague. And the plague went on for but half a day. It was supposed to originally be for three days, remember. And 70,000 of Israel died in the plague. The number of troops reporting to David had been diminished. Uh, it was David's pride. That was the sin that David committed in that. It was pride and Satan uh, will use that. It's his favorite tool against you today. So if somebody tries to get close to you and tells you how great you are, be careful because it's Satan working with his tools. It's pride, so uh, be humble. Um, what happened then, uh, the Lord, uh, David saw the angel of the Lord, the destroying angel, standing over Jerusalem, still with his sword drawn, ready for action. And that's when he came across the threshing floor of Ornan and God instructed him to purchase that place, which would be the home, uh, the future location of Solomon's temple, and to build an altar and make sacrifice. And that's where we left off as we ended our last lecture, David having uh, offered uh, burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. The Lord accepted those sacrifices because fire came down from heaven and consumed the offerings. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's Jesus' precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears today as we pick it up, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 27. And the Lord commanded the angel, this being the destroying angel that was still standing with sword drawn, ready to destroy Jerusalem. And he put up his sword again unto the sheath thereof. The plague uh, stayed. It's over. And God uh, was appeased by David's offerings and David following his instructions concerning the threshing floor of Ornan. Verse 28, and at that time, or from that time forward would probably be better said, when David saw that the Lord had answered him uh, with the fire from heaven, in other words, in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite, 
than he sacrificed there. Now David uh, would not have offered up burnt offerings. That was for the priest to do and that's what he obviously would have done this through the priest. And David realized that this was truly an holy place that, that God had, had answered his request that the plague be stopped and accepted his sacrifice. David, you know, admitted that he was wrong to the Lord. He said, Lord, you know, I'm the one who counted. Why are you punishing all the sheep of Israel? And God had compassion and stopped the plague. 29, for the tabernacle of the Lord, now this is referring to the mosaic tabernacle, uh, which is basically a tent, uh, which Moses made in the wilderness and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season, at that time, in the high place at Gibeon. Gibeon uh, was located in uh, the tribe of Benjamin's territory and that's where it wasn't a, an authorized place to offer. Well, what we're getting at here though is that from the time that David made the altar per God's instructions at Ornan's threshing floor. Uh, it was legal to make sacrifice at Gibeon where the Mosaic Tabernacle was. They had also constructed an altar where the tent that David erected in Jerusalem was. So uh, what they're getting at here is that, that David, some, some scholars say that David was afraid of the angel of the Lord is the reason that he would no longer make sacrifice at Gibeon or uh, at the tent that he had constructed in Jerusalem. Some say it was too far uh, for him to go to Gibeon, but uh, Gibeon and Judah, or Benjamin and Judah better said, had a common border. Uh, Gibeon was only eight miles from Jerusalem. So uh, in fact, David's son Solomon uh, would make sacrifice at Gibeon. And, and it, the, the, the argument that it was too far for him to go just won't hold water. Um, verse 30, But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid because of the sword of the angel of the Lord. I think more correctly, David would from this day forward offer at the Ornan's threshing floor uh, for fear that the plague would return because it was here that God had said uh, build an altar here and that stopped the plague. So if David offered somewhere else he might think that the plague would come back and that's the reason he was fearful out of concern for the people. Now chapters and verses, the numbers, are by man's design. I think most of you probably realize that the original manuscripts don't have chapter numbers, verse numbers. That's all by man's design. And I think man missed the boat in this particular case in that verse one of chapter 22, in my opinion, and many other Bible scholars, it should have been verse 31 of the previous chapter, chapter 21. Let's read it as such. Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering for Israel. This is a place where God's grace and mercy was manifested. Uh, it didn't happen at Gibeon. It didn't happen at the tent that David had constructed in Jerusalem. It happened at Ornan's threshing floor. And that's what David is saying. Chapter 22 through chapter 29 are peculiar to uh, the Chronicles. You won't find the information that we're going to have in the remainder of Chronicles chapter 1 in the books of Samuel or the books of Kings. What we're going to find in chapter 22 is David uh, doing as much as he can to prepare for the building of God's house. And Solomon's temple uh, is what it became known as. And uh, also we learn in this chapter why it would not be David who built the house of God. So with that, let's pick it up with verse 2, which I think should be verse 1 of chapter 22, and it reads, 
And David commanded <clears throat> to gather together the strangers that were in the land of Israel. And he set masons to hew wrought stones to build the house of God. Now these foreigners, uh, strangers, they, they could be translated foreigners, and it's written in 2 Samuel chapter 12, 31, that the Canaanites that remained in the land and the people of Ammon who were conquered by David in Israel, and they became forced labor. And there was a, quite a number of them, as I started to mention in 2 Samuel chapter 12, th verse 31, states that there were 153,600. Uh, that's quite a, quite a workforce. Now, um, what's happening here that there was not a hammer or an ax to be heard at the place, the site where the temple was being constructed. So what they did was they cut the stones for Solomon's temple at a location away, a quarry obviously, and then they transported them to the temple because there was not to be the sound of an ax or a hammer while Solomon's temple was being built. <clears throat> Verse three, and David prepared iron in abundance for the nails for the doors of the gates and for the joinings and brass in abundance without weight. In other words, there was so much of it that they didn't bother weighing it or couldn't weigh it. Now, there was also to be no iron in the tabernacle. And this iron is not for the tabernacle, it's for the nails that would be used in the gates that uh, separated the inner court from the outer court and then also the entrance into the outer court. <clears throat> Verse four, and cedar trees in abundance. For the Zidonians and they of Tyre uh, brought much cedar wood to David. Solomon uh, would also make a treaty with Hiram, the king of Tyre, uh, to supply uh, wood and other things that they had there. They traded them basically for oil and foodstuffs uh, which the people of Tyre needed. Uh, Solomon had quite an appetite for building himself and it was a time of peace. Uh, not only is he credited with building Solomon's temple, uh, he built quite a palace for himself and also other structures uh, in and around uh, the complex. Now the Zidonians, which were uh, also called Phoenicians by some, uh, were very skilled in identifying, choosing wood, uh, how to properly cut the wood, uh, how to ship it or transport it without damaging the wood. And what they did was they tied uh, these massive cedar trees in, into floats and they floated them from Tyre uh, and th through the Mediterranean Sea and then in Joppa, which is the port of Jerusalem unto this day, they would take them out of the Mediterranean Sea and transport them the remaining few miles into Jerusalem. Now, what David's doing, he, he's not going to be allowed to uh, build the house of God, but he's stockpiling materials, uh, getting as much ready as he can. Um, his, his son, Solomon, is very young at this point, 19 I believe was, would be when Solomon assumed the throne of the most powerful nation in the world. Uh, David is attempting as much as he can to turn over an orderly kingdom to his son so that he's not faced with any uh, major uh, problems to start his reign, get, get his son off on the right foot. Verse five. And David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender, 19, maybe 20. <clears throat> and the house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnifical, this means large, uh, of fame and of glory, of glorious fame, in other words, throughout all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it so David prepared abundantly before his death, David doing all that he can 
to make sure things go smoothly. Now, David didn't decide how the temple was to be built. God drew the plans for the temple on David, it's written in the Kings, and then David communicated that to Solomon. Verse 6, Then he called for Solomon his son and charged him to build an house for the Lord God of Israel. Solomon, uh, the prime of it is the same as the prime for a Hebrew word that probably is the most well-known Hebrew word among non-Hebrew speaking people. It's shalom, which is peace, and Solomon meaning peaceable. And it would be a time of peace that Solomon would be able to build uh, not only the temple, but all the other uh, buildings that he was responsible for. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God. And we learned in chapter, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 17, David was sitting in his house, fancy uh, palace made lined with cedars, and he looked out the window and he saw the Ark of the Covenant under a mere tent. And he decided, well, I think I, he told his well, prophet there that was near him, I, I think I'm going to build a house for God. And the prophet said, do what's right in your mind. You know, God is with you. That was what the prophet's personal opinion was. Then God expressed his opinion, and he told David through, through the prophet, <clears throat> when did I ask since the time of the judges for anyone to build me a house? <clears throat> it would be in that chapter that God would make that fantastic promise to Solomon, to David, that Messiah would come through his seed. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 8. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed blood abundantly. This is the reason David would not be allowed to build the house of God. And hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build an house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. Now, some of the blood that David spilled on the earth, God didn't have a problem with. How do I know that? Well, when David was going up against the Philistines, he inquired of the Lord, should I go up and fight against the Philistines? And the Lord said, yes, go up and fight. And in fact, there's one time uh, God led his army against the Philistines. So uh, my point is some of the blood that David spilled had to be done because it provided that time of peace when Solomon could build uh, the temple of God, Solomon's temple. <clears throat> there, were, there was peace on every border. Why? Because they had defeated the enemies on the other side of that border. Verse 9, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest. Now that could certainly apply to Solomon, but it also applies to his only begotten son, uh, and I'm speaking of the Lord's only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And I will give him rest, or peace, from all his enemies round about on all, every border. <clears throat> For his name shall be Solomon, which means peaceable. And I will give peace and quietness, or tranquility, unto Israel in his days. <clears throat> the following one verse compresses uh, chapter 17 of this book, verses 12 and 13. He shall build an house for my name, Yahweh, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, that last part does not apply to Solomon. Why? Because Solomon reigned for 40 years. Uh, his seed line, Zedekiah, ruled for several centuries after Solomon, but Zedekiah 
was the last one uh, king of Judah before they went into captivity to the Babylonians. There is a future uh, ruler of, uh, that will rule forever, that is Messiah, when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This reminded me of when Gabriel, uh, the archangel, appeared to Mary when she had been touched by the Holy Spirit and was with child with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verses 30 and 33. Uh, Gabriel said, <clears throat> I will give uh, him, to, he said to Mary, I will give to him the throne of his father David and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And that uh, will come to pass. Verse 11, Now my son, <clears throat> the Lord be with thee and prosper thou and build the house of the Lord thy God as he hath said, of thee. And with God's help, big jobs can be made easy. Uh, I think this ministry is an example of that. Uh, what once was a small church in a small town in northwest Arkansas, uh, Arnold Murray, Pastor Arnold Murray, used to always say, Sons, if we do the, the work, the Lord will provide the bricks. And that certainly has come to pass. And, and I'm not talking about bricks as stone and mortar <clears throat> to build a ministry. Uh, a ministry shouldn't be the extravagant buildings uh, that make up the campus. And if you've ever been to Shepherd's Chapel, you know we don't put a whole lot of resources into the campus. Uh, we have made some recent improvements in the campus, but. Uh, for the most part, we're, we're not an opulent uh, church. Uh, we put the money that comes in back into buying television time, uh, which is what keeps uh, the Word of God uh, out to the people. But big jobs become easy with God's help. Don't forget that. You can apply that to your life today. You want to be successful in life? then make sure that God is helping you because that's when you are successful, uh, that's when blessings flow in your life. Verse 12, only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, underline that wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge or establish thee concerning Israel that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. <clears throat> Second Chronicles uh, chapter 1, verse 7, and the following verses, we're going to learn that the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he asked Solomon, he said, ask what you will of me. What, what do you want from me? Uh, did Solomon ask for uh, a lot of gold and silver, riches? No. Did Solomon ask for a long life? No. Solomon asked for wisdom so that he could rule over so great a people as Israel. Solomon write, would write, go on to write a book. It's called the book of Proverbs. And in the Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7, he makes a very wise statement, and that is that the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, but fools despise instruction. Solomon knew the value of wisdom and understanding. <clears throat> Verse 13, Then shalt thou prosper if, uh-oh, here we have that big little word, I-F. If means that there's a condition that follows. If thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Dread not or fear not, nor be dismayed. Don't become confused. Solomon uh, failed on many occasions. Uh, toward his uh, end of his life, in his older years, Solomon fell away to idolatry. He had uh, 700 wives or 600 wives and 300 concubines, something like that. And he, many of them were foreign. 
and they brought foreign gods in and Solomon allowed them to build little uh, temples to their gods on the Mount of Olives and he would even go out and worship them. That's the reason the nation of Israel was split under Solomon's son Rehoboam. Verse 14, David continues to his son, Now behold, in my trouble, or in my labors, I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold and a thousand thousand talents of silver. That's a million talents of silver. And of brass and iron without weight, for it is in abundance. Timber also and stone have I prepared, and thou mayest add thereto. All of this uh, stored up, and some people, scholars or the critics, higher critics, say that's impossible that Israel would have had that much gold and that much silver. I don't think so. It goes back to the time of Moses when Israel was coming out of Egypt. God told the people of Israel to borrow, uh, which probably better ask, of the Egyptians uh, precious metals, stones, and, and, and then rightly they deserved it because they had uh, donated 400 years of slave labor uh, in bondage to the Egyptians. And so they uh, gave the people of Israel uh, precious metals. Uh, under David, it goes all the way back to Hadarezer, the king of Zoba. Uh, they took the spoils of war from him. Uh, Tu'u uh, sent uh, gold and silver to David after he had defeated Hadarezer because Tu'u was an enemy of Hadarezer and they'd been fighting for several years. Uh, the Edomites defeated by David, the Moabites, the, the Ammonites. There, there were peoples that uh, had camels that they made gold necklaces for their camels. They had so much gold. And when Israel defeated them, uh, they, they took that gold and silver as spoils of war. <clears throat> I've never heard someone put a dollar value, equivalent dollar value today to what all these materials would be worth, but you can be assured it's in uh, the, probably the tens of millions of dollars. Verse 16, of the gold, the silver, and the brass, and the iron, there is no number. I think this means there is no limit. You, you have what you need. Arise therefore, be doing, and the Lord be with thee. The most important thing as far as the success of Solomon. And it's the most important thing in your life today as well. I say to you, the Lord be with thee. And what I mean by that is when you make major decisions in your life, let the Lord have an influence in that. He makes right decisions. He, he is concerned with your welfare. He loves you. He may or may not love what you're doing, but he does have your best interest at heart if you're doing the best you can to do things his way. Now in verses 17 through 19, uh, David commands the princes of Israel to assist his son Solomon when he begins building the temple of Solomon, the house of God. Verse 17 David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon, his son, saying. Now, these princes not to be understood as the other sons of David. Each of the tribes had major uh, families, elders they're called in some places. Some places they're referred to as princes of the tribes of Israel. And that's what we're talking about here, not the sons of David. Is not the Lord your God with you? Question. And hath he not given you rest on every side? The question to both of the first two questions, yes and yes. For he hath given the inhabitants of the land unto mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Give God credit 
uh, for our good fortune, I think David is saying here. He took the land of Canaan, which was inhabited by the Canaanites. They had houses built, uh, wells digged, vineyards, olive yards. Israel didn't have to do much when they moved into the, the land after they defeated the Canaanites. And as it's written in Isaiah chapter 5, God said, you know, I took uh, the nation of Israel and I made a vineyard for you and dug the wells, made the wine press, made the olive yards, gave you the choices of vine. And when I came to, to reap the fruit of it, what did I get? I came expecting good grapes, but I got poison grapes, which is uh, or wild grapes is the way it's translated in Isaiah chapter 5, which means, and is trans, should be translated, poison berries. But uh, David asking the tribe princes, uh, you have been very fortunate and prospered under the Lord. Help my son Solomon build the temple. Verse 19 to conclude this chapter. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. One of the last bits of advice David would give Solomon we'll read in chapter 28 verse 9 of First Chronicles and he told Solomon seek the Lord and you will find him forsake the Lord and he will cast you off forever arise therefore and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God the um, golden candlestick, the menorah, uh, the showbread table, the, uh, the ark of God, the vessels utilized to worship Yahweh, into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord, to be built to the name of Yahweh. And it was a tremendous task that Solomon was given, but he had a lot of help. Uh, over a hundred thousand laborers uh, David, his father, had stockpiled uh, all the materials that would be necessary to build the ark. So uh, he had a lot of help, Solomon did. Mostly, though, God was with Solomon. And we'll come back in our next lecture. David's getting on up in years at this point in time, the time of this writing I'm referring to. And he's going to select, and actually God chooses who's going to be David's replacement. It is Solomon, of course. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout the U.S. and our good friends to the north in Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that uh, 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we try to teach God's Word in a positive manner. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the 800 number. You don't need a telephone. Talk to your Heavenly Father. It's called prayer. And you can go to Him anytime, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. 
You don't have to get down on your knees and close your eyes. You can pray while you're driving down the highway. Don't close your eyes if you choose to do that, please. But we do have these prayer requests. We come to you the United is one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. And we ask a special blessing on each of these if it is your will. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, let's get to some questions, see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have Ken in Mississippi. Uh, one of my instructors in college was telling me that there is only room for 144,000 people in heaven. Is this correct? No, I, I'm going to correct your instructor. I don't know where he's pulling from. I think probably uh, where we're told how many of the elect there are, which is, is 144,000. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. But you can read in Revelation chapter 5, verse 11, John was taken uh, to the third heaven age, and he saw the angels round about the throne of God, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Uh, that's a whole lot more than 144,000. It kind of means countless. Nana in Maryland, tell me, did <coughs> Lot, excuse me, tell me, did Lot give his daughter to the man at the door, or did he just offer her to them? <coughs> excuse me, in a movie I saw Lot gave her to them, and they killed her, but I don't see this in God's word. Please help, you're correct. Uh, Genesis chapter 19 verses 4 through 8, Lot only offered her to these men. He probably knew that they were sodomites and that they weren't interested in women anyway. They're, they were interested in the young men, the angels, that uh, had come to Lot's home. <clears throat> in Judges, the book of Judges, there was an instance where a Levite, uh, the same situation happened when they stayed at Gibeah, in Benjamin when he went to get his concubine and the sodomites surrounded the house and said uh, send out the young man referring to the Levite. Uh, they did send out his concubine, they abused her and she died. That you'll find in the book of Judges. That did not happen to Lot's daughter. Roger in Georgia, <clears throat> I would like to have some scripture on pork. Is it bad to eat? Swine's flesh is prohibited in the health laws. It's an unclean meat. Revelation chapter 11, uh, verse 7. Uh, God says too in Isaiah chapter 65, verses 4 and 5, that those who eat swine's flesh and those who are holier than thou are like smoke in God's nose. Mike in California, can you explain the difference between Israel and Judah. And well, when the nation of Israel split, it was the, the last king over all of Israel was Solomon. And because of his idolatry and falling away to worshiping other gods, God rent the kingdom from his seed line, his son, Rehoboam, and gave 10 of the 12 tribes to Jeroboam, who was the first man king over the ten northern tribes which became known as Israel. Then Judah uh, became known as Judea, the regional area, uh, uh, but the, those tribes remain split unto this day. But we learn in Ezekiel chapter 37 that the two nations, the two sticks as they're referred to, uh, will be rejoined at some point in the future. Kathy in Arizona, uh, thank you for your kind comments. My question, once we are in spirit form, will we go by our name uh, just as we were named as humans in the flesh? Well, those who overcome the Antichrist will have a new name written. Uh, you can read that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. I personally like the name that we'll have uh, Hepzibah, as it's written in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 4. 
Uh, do you know what Hepzibah means? If you translate it, it means my delight is in her. And at that point in time when Jesus returns and we're the bride of Christ, I want him to be able to say of me, my delight is in her. Okay, Marvin in Indiana. Do we know Noah's wife's name? No, we aren't uh, given the name of Noah's wife nor his three daughters-in-law, uh, although we are told that they were on the ark along with Noah and his three sons. <clears throat> you follow with the second question. I have friends and family that are doubters. They ask me questions like, can God build a rock that's too heavy for him to lift? What am I supposed to say? I would ignore them. They're, they obviously uh, don't believe in God or they wouldn't uh, tempt him that way. Uh, don't cast your pearls before swine. Uh, you stay close to the Father. and You know, I know when it's family in particular, you, you want them so badly to see the truth that has been revealed to you. But you have to keep in mind that everything happens on God's time frame. And, and all you're responsible for is planting a seed. Uh, then it's up to God as to whether that seed germinates and grows into a plant that's capable of producing fruit on its own. Anne in Texas, I thank you. You're a very good pastor. Thank you. I have a very, oh, Anne, you have a very good staff. I'll agree with you there. We have uh, a very small number of employees and volunteers that accomplish a lot of work on getting God's word out to the world. I just can't understand how the devil would take God and tempt him, it had to be Jesus in Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And if God is Jesus, then the devil has won. All he wants to get rid of Jesus from the beginning of time. Luke chapter 4, verse 8, was the devil that dumb for 40 days? You said they are the same, different offices. God lives in us, all the Bible told us so. Um, six years been studying with Shepherd's Chapel. All right, well, Jesus was teaching there in Luke chapter 4, verse 8. The sister uh, chapter to that is Matthew chapter 4. But what was happening was Satan was attempting to tempt Jesus. Uh, after he'd been in the wilderness for 40 days uh, without anything to eat and very little water. So he was in a weakened state of the flesh. And what Satan did there was tempt Jesus and said, well, if you'll worship me, uh, he took him up to a high pinnacle and he said, if you'll worship me, everything you see I will give to you. And what did Jesus do? Jesus taught us how to respond when Satan attempts to tempt us. He said, get thee hence, Satan. In another place, he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, if you think that Satan has won, uh, and I would encourage you to read Revelation 20, and please read it in its entirety. Satan does not win. Uh, I've read the back of the book. God wins. Satan goes into the lake of fire. Addie in Georgia, thank you for your teaching. Uh, thank you for that, how you explain things so we at home are homebound and others can understand. I just found out a dear good friend of mine that her cousin killed herself. It seems like this is happening way too much. And I heard almost every day someone dying. I feel God is telling everybody to pay attention as you say, watchmen watch. And I agree, we are living in a very evil uh, generation. And I think that's understandable, why? Because the, I think the third of God's children that followed Satan in the first earth age are alive in the flesh now that we're nearing the end of the second earth age. Why? Because it would only be fitting that they be on earth 
when the Antichrist appears. They worship Satan in the first earth age. They're probably going to worship Satan in the second. But that's the, what the reason for this second earth age. Will they follow God or will they follow Satan? Dennis from Arizona. Um, is it a sin for a man to dance with a woman and in parentheses physical contact like a waltz? Some churches forbid it because it is a form of foreplay even if you are married to the woman. Is this wrong? I never ever have found any such thing in the Bible and I've never read anything in the Bible that has a prohibition against dancing in God's Word either. You know, and that's, you know, different churches have different rules and I guess if you want to be a member of their church, you have to follow their rules. But uh, uh, ask them to show you that in the Bible is what I would be asking. David from Georgia, I know that those who don't work should not eat, but what about those who have lost their job? Should an unemployed Christian be fasting until they can find a job, or is this just referring to those who refuse to work? I think you've got a good understanding of it, David. Uh, that Second Thessalonians is what David's referring to, chapter 3, verse 10. 10 says that if you don't work, those who don't work uh, shouldn't eat. And that applies to those who are physically able but are so totally lazy that they refuse to work. Uh, they would rather uh, depend on some government program uh, that uh, provides them with lifelong welfare. Uh, they're too lazy to work. And now people, on the other hand, there are people who are down on their luck and they're trying and those people deserve a helping hand. And you know, that's what our welfare programs, uh, uh, unemployment insurance, things of that nature, were designed to help. Were people who were, for a period of time, down on their luck and needing some help. But some people have turned that into a lifelong endeavor, which in my opinion is wrong. Hugh from Ohio, what does cast into outer darkness mean? Could that mean into outer space. No, it doesn't mean outer space, you. Uh, and you'll find what he's talking about in Matthew uh, chapter 22, verse 13. And it's outer darkness. And it means outside the kingdom of God. Uh, in Matthew 25, you had the ten virgins. And five of them had enough oil, which is symbolic of truth. Five of them did not. Uh, the ones who had oil went in and the door was shut. Uh, the virgins that didn't have oil, uh, truth, were cast into outer darkness. When they knock, Jesus will say, get out of my sight, I never knew you. <coughs> there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Patricia from Arizona. I read that after you have believed Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins, and resurrected from the grave, that you are no longer under the law. <clears throat> that is a new person you only want to do right to please the Lord. I was baptized when I was 12 years old. What if you were a young person then and did some backsliding? and years later started to live your life for the Lord again and replanted. Should I be saved again? No, you shouldn't be saved again. Uh, this is false teaching. Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6 tell us that once we come to knowledge of truth, once we're saved, like you said, in other words, and then we fall away, we should repent don't think that you have to be saved again because that's like re-crucifying Christ. And it once was enough for him to pay the price on the cross. You're the one who backslid. You're the one who should repent. D from South Carolina. I recently became a member of your Bible study. Well, welcome aboard. 
a few questions. When you discuss the millennium, what does that mean? Well, literally a millennium is a thousand years. When you hear us talking about the millennium, we're referring to the Lord's day, the exact thousand year period you can find in Revelation chapter 20, verse four. You also speak of the churches of Philadelphia and Smyrna. Uh, I don't understand, I beg you to explain. Well, no need to beg. Smyrna, you'll read about in Revelation chapter two. Philadelphia, you'll read about, <coughs> excuse me, in Revelation chapter three. Those were the only two out of the seven churches listed in Revelation chapter two and three that Christ found no fault with. What was it that they taught? Well, it's important we should know. They taught who those who claimed to be of our brother Judah, but did lie and were of the synagogue of Satan. That's the Kenites. And welcome aboard again. Keep studying. We encourage you. Forest in Kentucky. I praise Shepherd's Chapel for your method of teaching the scripture and using the King James Version Bible. Thank you for that. I also learned so much from the question and answer. Uh, I just want your thoughts. I, okay, and thank you for that. We know Satan is a copycat. You got that right. Do you think Judas Iscariot may have been Satan's son like Cain was for, in period, for Jesus said in John 6, verse 70, I think that is, one of you is a devil. The Trinity on that side, Satan, evil spirit, son, like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Interesting thought. Uh, Satan does have different offices, just like the Lord has different offices, the Son, uh, the Holy Spirit, Father. Uh, the offices of Satan are Lucifer. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, he was the serpent. Uh, he's called the dragon. Um, but uh, I don't believe Judas Iscariot was Satan's son. Uh, Satan, uh, that, that just doesn't fly. John from Arkansas, my question, please explain what Revelation chapter 1 verse 13 means well, or what it's talking about. Well, Revelation 13 chapter, excuse me, Revelation chapter 1 verses uh, 13 through 20 are all discussing Jesus Christ. And it gives a description of what Jesus looks like in his transfigured body there. Addie from Georgia. <clears throat> I've been telling people about Shepherd's Chapel. I have a question. Have you ever heard of putting the Holy Bible in olive oil and using the oil to anoint with? I've never heard you or your dad say anything like that a friend told me about this. Well, that isn't biblical. Uh, sounds to me like a good way to ruin a Bible as well. Um, all you need to do if you intend to use oil for anointing is obtain a regular virgin olive oil at your grocery store. Uh, then obtain a small vial. Your pharmacist might be able to help you and sell you a small empty uh, vial. And then take the oil, a small amount of it, put it in the vial, and then set the rest aside. It has other purposes. Cooking, it's good for cooking. Uh, it's good for your skin. But the small amount you use in the vial, in prayer, you ask God to bless it and tell him that you'll use it in obedience to him and that you understand it's not the oil that has the power uh, to heal and to cast off devils, but his power and then keep that oil for anointing purposes only. Don't ever forget to anoint in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. <coughs> Excuse me, Sherry from Kentucky. My nephew, who was 30 years old, committed suicide. He had been saved and baptized some years back. He had chose, he had made some bad choices he has a 10-year-old son. My question is, if he went to the other side of the gulf, is he suffering or being tormented? He was very, very depressed. I am losing my mind. He was just like my own son. Please, please help me. Well, drop your pack and take five. 
uh, Sherry. That means relax a little bit. Don't be so anxious about this. Uh, understand your Heavenly Father is fair. Number one, he, he, he can't be persuaded to show favoritism. Uh, he doesn't favor one of his children over another. Um, he's completely objective in his judgment. And, you know, you said that your nephew was very, very depressed. Uh, depression can cause people to behave irrationally. And God knows what your nephew's heart and mind were when he took his own life. <clears throat> so, um, I don't think your nephew is on the wrong side of the gulf. <clears throat> he, he was a Christian, you said, and baptized. What happened to the Ark of the Covenant? You can read in Revelation uh, chapter 11, verse 19. Uh, it is in heaven. I think it probably was taken up with Elijah uh, when Elijah was taken up in the whirlwind. <clears throat> Mitchell in Texas. What does Caiaphas mean? Well, according to the Smith's Bible Dictionary, Caiaphas means depression. Um, he was appointed to be the high priest uh, over Judea, uh, not by God, but by the Romans. And uh, I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word. You make time every day to pull out the letter that He wrote to you and to seek information about God, to, to learn how you can become pleasing to Him. And I'll tell you what, it absolutely makes your Father's day when He looks down from heaven and He sees you with that letter open before you. You make His day, He is going to make your day as well. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others of our brothers and sisters who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, and it's this, you stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble, you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.